Welcome to the Explore Words Discover Worlds podcast, presented by Bradford Literature Festival. In this episode, we take a trip back to April 1944, when Rudolf Werber and Fred Wetzler became the first Jews ever to escape Auschwitz. After grappling with electrified fences, dodging watchtowers and evading the eagle-eyed SS with their vicious guard dogs in order to secure their freedom, Werber then began work on his next task, to reveal the horrors of the Holocaust via an eyewitness report that ultimately reached presidents, prime ministers and the Pope and saved over 20,000 lives. Originally recorded at Bradford Literature Festival 2022, Jonathan Friedland discusses this astonishing real-life tale chronicled in his new book, The Escape Artist. Welcome to Bradford Literature Festival. I hope we've seen you at something before, and if not, I hope we see you at something else. So without further ado, I'll pass over to Akil Ahmed, who is chairing the event. Enjoy. Hello. This, I know you've mentioned this is quite... For those of you who've been to the Bradford Literature Festival, you're probably thinking, this is very weird. They're not sat on there. We're standing here, and there's this whole kind of... It's a bit... We're, free, we're not freestyling. We are actually doing something slightly different. So obviously, with Jonathan Friedland, we have today with us today, who is giving us this fantastic conversation about his book, The Escape Artist. Um, what the format we're going to go with is, uh, once I've introduced Jonathan to you, he's then going to give you this fantastic presentation, and it really is, and I think it's really important, the presentation, and, um, and you're the guinea pigs, because you're the first people, aren't they? This they is going to be run on, so it, that, the, the prestige of that, yeah. <laughs> only at Bradford, Lit we, we, it's, it's, we should have been selling this as a kind of, you know, as a premiere of <laughs> what will become this incredible thing that Jonathan will take all over the world. Um, and then once we've done that, Jonathan will join with me on stage and we'll have a, we'll have a sl small conversation and then open it up to some fantastic questions in the room. So, I think you all know who Jonathan is, do you? Do you want me to give you the spiel about being a Guardian columnist and Radio 4 presenter <laughs> yeah, and all yeah. those kind of things? <laughs> An annoying man who reads, writes incredible books and all these kind of things, but no, he's, no, he's none of those things. He's, obviously, he's, a great, he's a great writer, columnist for the Guardian, and today he's going to be our guide through his book about the people who escaped from Auschwitz. So Jonathan, over to you. Thank you very much, and um, thanks to all of you for coming. Uh, as you heard, I'm talking about this book, The Escape Artist, which is the story of the first Jew, one of only four, who ever escaped from Auschwitz. And he did it to warn the world. Uh, the story, not his story, but the story of this book begins in this place. That is the Curzon Cinema in London. I think it's the Mayfair one, where I sat in 1986 when I was 19 years old. Just to save you the maths, it means I'm 55. Because <laughs> otherwise people just work it out and spend the next 10 minutes doing this. Um, I was 19 years old and I was there to see an extraordinary documentary film uh, called Shoah by Claude Landsman. And a few people nodding, it's a nine and a half hour epic documentary. They showed it in that cinema in two sessions, uh, four and a half hours each. Uh, and I went there with a friend uh, and very soon when we got in there, we realized this is not a usual screening. This is not a usual cinema experience. Partly it was the length of the film, but partly it was the audience. Because we realized when we went in, we could just hear from the accents that there were quite a few Holocaust survivors in the room. And my friend, because we were both 19, had made the slight mistake of bringing popcorn with him. And at one point early on in the film, he was munching on the popcorn and a voice, very Eastern European accent, said to him as she leaned over and gave him a sort of slap on the thigh, have you no respect, she said to him, because eating popcorn during Shoah. So something about the atmosphere of that film was unusual from the start, but we were watching it, and it's a very unusual kind of documentary because there's no archive film in it. It's all black and white. Sorry, it's all color. There's no black and white archive. Uh, and it's a su series, a succession of interviews with people who were there, who were eyewitnesses, mainly survivors. He actually interviews also a perpetrator, a Nazi war criminal, but who were involved in the 
slaughter of European Jewry, 6 million Jews. And Claude Lanzman's project was to get to the absolute granular detail of how it happened. So I'm watching the film, and to my 19-year-old self, it's a series of old, broken men, uh, and women both. Uh, they are they're gray-haired, they seem hunched and stooped. I realize now, actually, now that I'm older, they were probably mainly in their 50s, maybe 40s and 50s. 60s perhaps, but to me they look like broken and old men. And then suddenly, on the screen, sort of explodes onto the screen, comes this completely different person. There's a black and white still, but actually this, the, the thing was in color. There's Claude Landsman on the left, and the man he's talking to is identified as Rudolf Verba. You'll, as we talk through this, you'll realize it's that's, it's a bit more complicated than that. But he is there being interviewed in New York City. That's one of the shots. In another shot, there are the Twin Towers behind him. He's, where all the others are speaking in Polish or Czech, he's speaking in fluent English. He's got that, that's a tan leather coat. Uh, he looks very sort of dapper. There's something about him when he's moving, particularly the, of a sort of Al Pacino in Scarface kind of vibe about him. He's hugely charismatic. He has this unnerving habit of smiling all the way through while he's talking. And in fact, at one point, Claude Landsman calls him on it, and so he's describing terrible things that he saw. And he says, uh, I notice that you're smiling all the time. And Verba says to him, you prefer I should cry? It's a very strange moment in the film. He's a, com he's a completely different character from all the other people in the film. But it's not just his manner that leaps out at me, it's what he reveals. He says right at the start that he had escaped Auschwitz. Now, Landsman is actually not that interested in that. He wants to use Verba as a witness for everything he saw. But the 19-year-old me sitting there is thinking, what? You escaped from Auschwitz? Nobody escaped Auschwitz. And I knew enough then to know that certainly no Jews escaped Auschwitz. Since doing the research for this book, I've discovered that there were Soviet prisoners of war, quite a few of them escaped. Polish political prisoners, quite a few of them escaped. But Jews, it didn't really happen because the security was so tight that they never really got out. Um, but he was the exception. I carried this story around in my head for a very, very long time. It was 1986, and it was not until 30 years later, 2016, that I started and found myself thinking about him again. And that was the era, you'll remember the Oxford English Dictionary word of the year for 2016 was post-truth. It was the year of Brexit and Trump and fake news. And I found myself going back to the memory of this man because he had broken out of Auschwitz in order to get the truth out from under this mountain of lies. And that was his story. And I found myself thinking again and again about him. And so I two or three years ago, set myself to looking further into his life. So here he is at the start of his life. Or what should be the start. There he is, actually age 19, the age I was uh, when I saw the film. But that's actually him after the escape. He joined the Slovak resistance, we'll talk about that, but that's what he looked like. Rudolf Verba is how you would say it, but Rudolf Verba is how we'll say it. The story with him, really, he, the reason why I, partly, I called, referred to him as the escape artist is the Auschwitz escape was not his first escape. The order for his deportation from Slovakia, he was a young Jew in Slovakia, uh, born there in 1924 in rural Slovakia. Father was a sawmill owner, lived in the middle of the countryside. He showed exceptional promise very, very young. Uh, incredibly bright. Uh, p relatives told me he was reading the newspaper when he was two years old. He was just phenomenally sort of intelligent. He g went to the best school, more or less, in Slovakia, this high, the gymnasium in Bratislava, and then he turned up for school in the new term of autumn 1938. By then, a fascist government, not they hadn't been invaded, it wasn't German, but a fascist government in Slovakia was ruling, and he turned up at school to be turned away, to be told Jews are no longer welcome at the school and so he went to this back to this provincial town of Ternova and there um, a couple of months later or time passed but in, in February 1942 
an order came that he and the other Jews of his age, 16 to 30, were to be deported uh, and to meet at a certain place at a certain time to get on a train. He thought, I'm not going to do that. I'm a Slovak citizen. I speak Slovak. This is my country. I've never lived anywhere else. Of course, I'm not going to go on some train. And so the reason why I call the book The Escape Artist is he made his first escape. It's all detailed there in the book. It's, uh, we won't dwell on it now, but he was a serial escape artist. He kept on doing escapes. He was in, it was in one detention camp, then another. But eventually, because we uh, should get onto the heart of the story, on the last day of June 1942, we're coming up to the anniversary, 30th of June 1942, he arrives at this place. That's uh, Auschwitz, the main camp, because Auschwitz actually consisted of three large camps, Auschwitz I, Auschwitz II, Auschwitz III, 39 sub-camps. It was a huge, sprawling place. It became a kind of almost a city of death, this place. But the heart of it was the original camp. You can see those brick buildings there, Arbeit macht frei, work shall set you free, work makes you free, uh, above the gate. And the incredible thing is that Werber, in, in all the documents and everything else that he describes, talks about how there was this degree of relief at arriving at this place because the buildings are brick buildings, the pathways were pa paved. It looked like a place of sort of substance, which compared to some of the other places they'd already been, they thought, well, maybe we'll be better here. The story of this place was, the, uh, and I think people get often confused about it because we know of Auschwitz famously as the death camp where people arrived and within hours they were sent to the gas chambers. The odd thing about Auschwitz, the thing that makes it exceptional, was it, was, it had two functions simultaneously. So it was uh, a death camp but it was also a concentration camp, a, 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 a meaning like a slave labor camp, two functions at once. And so this place was where you know, prisoners were kept. What happened every time a transport would arrive was that 90 to 95% of the people were taken off immediately to be gassed, their life expectancy measured in hours. But 5 to 10% would be peeled off for work as slave laborers. And Rudolf Werber, at that point, his name was Walter Rosenberg, we'll, we'll come to that, he arrived there and uh, was selected for labor, for slave labor. And the incredible thing about him, and the reason why Claude Landsman wanted to speak to him for that film, is that normally, if a, a Jew arrived at Auschwitz, 90 to 95 percent of them gassed within hours. The five or 10 percent who'd become slave workers would be worked for two or three months, and then through disease or exhaustion or a beating would be dead. Werber was in Auschwitz for nearly two years. It was extremely unusual. Uh, it meant that he was the kind of ultra survivor he, and the ultra witness because he had seen so much. As a worker, he was moved from this place to this place to this place. And it meant he had this almost panoramic view of what happened in Auschwitz. He had this, and that's why Landsman wanted to interview him because he'd seen almost every stage of what happened there. So he was taken, he goes through a series of jobs. He's involved in on a construction site where they're building these factories that will be used by some of Germany's biggest corporate names, IG Farben, Siemens, Krupps. They, they were delighted for this new opportunity to have this vast industrial empire where you didn't pay for the labor. You had slave laborers there. And Rudy himself saw there would be civilians there in uniform who were corporate executives from head office in Berlin, supervising the construction, saying, no, a bit there, a bit to the right, a bit to the left, never objecting to the fact that their workers were slaves. He was one of those. But eventually, he moved to this place. That is just one part of a mountain of blankets, and you can see a suitcase there. This was a place that was known as Canada. Canada with a K. It was the Auschwitz El Dorado. It was a place within Auschwitz where the possessions of all the arrivals were brought. Cases, uh, pots, pans, blankets, and were, would form a huge mountain. And they required workers, and you can see them there, to sort them into piles uh, 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 and, and heaps and 
Rudy, young, aged just 17 at the time, was stationed there. His first job was to just carry the cases off the trains that would arrive with his, uh, that, had that had been brought there, two suitcases in each hand, and almost running as fast as he could with these cases, put them on a pile, then other people would come, open them up, and empty out the content. As it, uh, everything that happened at double time. Rudy once said it was as if like a film speeded up because there were people standing over them with whips and with guns, uh, and they would have to form these piles. Here you're just seeing the piles of trunks and cases, but also bedding. But there would also have been piles of pots and pans, clothing, men's clothing, women's clothing, children's clothing, spectacles, shoes. There was a pile that Rudy noticed early on of prams that had been brought there. At first, he was just trying to keep it together and work out what, you know, how to stay alive doing this job, not get whipped, not get beaten, how you might get a morsel of food. But slowly, he began to have a thought. And what's amazing to us now in retrospect is it took time for him to come to this realization. All these piles of pots and pans, he thought, hang on a minute. When I arrived on that train, it was only for able-bodied men my age. How come there's all these clothes that belong to older people? And what are the pots and pans doing? And why are there children's clothes here? And slowly he realized that there were people being brought to Auschwitz who weren't being used as prisoners like him, as slave laborers like him. They were going somewhere else, but where were they? He looked around and there weren't any children, and yet in front of him were children's shoes, this pile of children's shoes. And there over there is hundreds of prams, but he can see no babies. And slowly, because even inside Auschwitz, they didn't know it was Auschwitz, if you know what I mean. They didn't know what was going on. Slowly he comes to the realization that this is something that is new in human history. No place like this had ever existed before, but he begins to put two and two together and realize this is a killing center. People are being brought here uh, for the sole purpose of being killed, and this is all their stuff. And this, uh, I could say the Auschwitz El Dorado, because people also didn't just bring the basics, pots and pans, they also brought things that they thought they might use for bribes. So there were people stationed going through the clothes, running their fingers along the seams of clothes, because one in 500 you know, hemlines might have a diamond in there that would have been kept, and those would then be tossed in a sort of zinc bucket, and then the SS would round up these buckets and collect all the coins and notes to the point where one of those, bigger than that, a trunk would be filled almost every day with foreign currency, jewels, diamonds, etc. This was a profit center. Uh, and slowly, Rudy began to realize what he was glimpsing. His next job, though, is uh, important um, because he, only, he, he works there for a few months and then for a complicated reason or an extraordinary reason, which I tell in the book, he's moved to this place. Uh, hang on. There. That's the Alta Judenrampe. The, oh, on the right is what we're looking at. The old Jewish ramp, it was called. It's a railway platform, essentially. Long, a stretch of railway, a kind of siding. He suddenly has the job before Canada, if you like, which is the trains coming in. His job is to be part of that group of people who unload the trains. Every, those you know, long goods trains, 50, 70 carriages, not carriages, they're cattle trucks. The doors would open, people would almost fall out. They'd been in there sometimes three, four days, starved. Uh, they would tumble out. His job was, first of all, to get their things, because this was a profit center, the objects were vital, and then to clear out the people, including the dead and the dying. There were always people who hadn't survived the journey. And they, he had to do that for 10 months straight working on that ramp. Usually at night, there would be transports would arrive at night. Occasionally on the railway they would see, because it was the same railway, they would see a passenger train, the train going from Krakow to Vienna, and they would see sometimes the dining car, because the train would go by slowly, and they would see passengers inside eating with fine china, looking out the window, seeing these prisoners and these transports arrive. This was a regular railway line. It wasn't some new thing. Um, Two big realizations happened to him in those 10 months, and they would lead, they would change his life and change the course of history. The two realizations. The first 
is he realized that the key ingredient in the Nazi method, the, the thing that made the whole thing possible, was deception. The Jewish victims who arrived on those trains had been lied to at every step of the way. They had been told they were being resettled in the East. They were being taken to new homes, new communities. So when Rudy opened up the cases and saw children's textbooks, he thought, they think they're going to be schools in this new place. And he would open up, and the pots and pans, they've brought them because they think they're starting a new life here. And that was why the Jews were coming off in relatively orderly fashion, lining up in these columns, because they believed they were going to be taken to their new homes. And they believed it because that's what they were told. And they were still told that even there on the Judenrampe, the SS would say to them, tell me, what is your trade? Ah, you're a doctor. We will need that in, our, uh, in your village. Talk to me afterwards. We need that. You're a shoemaker. Good. Make sure you queue up uh, over there afterwards. The lie was kept going all the way through. And Rudy realized this was absolutely central because he saw in those 10 months how the Nazi method required order because they were processing thousands of people at speed and they needed calm uh, and, uh, uh, and sort of method. Uh, and he understood that very quickly and he, got, I saw it, he saw it close up because if ever there was even a hint of what was going to happen, and it did once happen, that one of the prisoners whispered to one of the people, you're going to get killed, you know, do something sort of thing, immediately that person would be taken to one side and shot. There was, they all knew, working on that platform, the one thing you could never do was breathe a word of what was going on. And the lies continued all the way. Famously, I'm sure you know, in crematorium two, gas chamber two, there were fake shower heads uh, in the ceiling. It wasn't everywhere in Auschwitz-Birkenau, but it was there so that people, uh, even at the last second, thought that they were going to have a shower. The gas that came through, Zyklon B, initially, when it was initially made, used to have a very strong scent, an artificial odorant had been put in there to alert people to the danger. You know, when it was used in sort of civil use, the SS asked the manufacturers, would they please remove the odorant? They didn't want any clue, even at the last second. Because, as Rudy would later say, the Nazis realized it is much easier to kill sheep than it is to hunt deer. What he meant by that was he, orderly columns of victims is what you need to do an operation like this, where they were killing thousands a day. If you started having people running off in different directions, like deer in the countryside shooting them, you'd miss people, it would take too long, it would be chaos. So they needed order. That was his great insight, that deception uh, was central. It's not, it wasn't a, 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 you know, an, option, an, an added extra. It was the core of the method. That, in turn, led to his other great uh, realization, which is the only way, he concluded, age 17, 18, the only way to break this Nazi process was to break the deception. And that meant somebody had to get out, escape, and warn the Jews what waited, awaited them at the end of the railway line, because they didn't know. That was one thing he was clear on. Everybody who got off that train had no idea what was about to happen to them. So he, in, with this sort of wonderful arrogance of youth, decides, that might as well be me. I should escape here. He'd always wanted to escape. Remember, he'd done his other escapes. But now he had a purpose. He had to get out and warn the world, yes, but specifically the Jews, don't get on those trains. He didn't have any illusions, by the way, that they could uh, launch an armed revolt. He knew a lot of them were children, they were old people. All he wanted was, if they knew, maybe they would panic. Maybe there'd be chaos, there could be a stampede. And that would be enough, he thought, to throw sand in the gears of the Nazi mission. So he then set about gathering the information that would be enough to warn the world. And again, with amazing foresight for one so young, he knew the evidence had to be meticulous and comprehensive. And so he set about, incredible though it seems, collecting data. Every, he, would, he had a brilliant head for numbers he would me and would later become a scientist. He would memorize every transport that came in, the number of cattle trucks, how many on each cattle truck, and therefore make an estimate for that transport, remembering the point of origin. So he would say, okay, 15th of May, 1943, Grodno, Poland, 
roughly 50 in X number of trucks, that transport was 950. He would remember the number of the transport based on the serial number of the handful, the 5 or 10%, of prisoners off that train who were spared for work. So I say spared, they would be killed through hard labour. But those, those prisoners who were selected would always have serial numbers. You know, famously, the blue ink tattoo on the arm or on the uniform, those corresponded to the prisoners. He began memorizing each one. He did it through a kind of child's memory game. You know, the I went to market and I had a basket and an apple and a, a broom. And then the next day I went to market, had a basket, an apple, a broom and a chair. That's how he mem memorized each transport. Each day you would add another transport and say it over and over again. If we have time afterwards, I'll tell you about how I've proved his extraordinary memory because there is amazing corroborating evidence that he had a freakishly good memory. I was toying with even calling the book The Memory Man. But somehow he memorized transport after transport while he was in that place. He then, obviously, was never, he never stopped thinking about escape. He had, he knew he couldn't do it alone. There was an, he had an escape partner as the, one of the only ways of trusting people in Auschwitz, where there were informers and people desperate for a morsel of food could betray you. He, the one thing you could do is if you, knew, if you met somebody or knew somebody who you had known before Auschwitz, that enabled there to be a degree of trust. There was one prisoner left who had also come from Ternava in Slovakia by the name of Fred Wetzel. The two of them trusted each other because they knew each other before Auschwitz. And together they hatched the most ingenious escape plan. I'm not going to give it all away because I want you to read the book. But suffice it to say this, they had spotted a gap in the Nazis' defences. Remember, the Jews are the most closely guarded prisoners there. If they stray even a few yards out of line, they would either be beaten or shot. The fences around the inner camp where the uh, barracks were where, they, where the workers, slaves, slept at night, were behind not one 15-foot electrified fence, but two. Merely to touch it was to guarantee death, and sometimes even just as you approached it, you would get shot for trying to escape. But despite that, and the watchtowers that were around the outer camp, every 80 yards, these wooden watchtowers, where there'd be a, an SS man with a machine gun, they spotted a gap in the defences, not a physical gap, but a loophole. And it turned on the Nazis' great flaw, their fatal flaw, which was their predictability. They had a routine and they stuck to it. And I won't give away more than that, but the teenage Walter Rosenberg, as he then was, and Fred Wetzler spotted that gap and realised that if you were prepared, and I won't tell you why or how, but if you could somehow hide within the camp for three days and three nights, without being detected by the 2,000 SS men who would search, and their 300, 200 highly trained dogs who could sniff out human life. If you could do that, there was a way out. And incredibly, on the 7th of April, 1944, they found that way out. That is the telegram that was issued uh, and sent to every Gestapo station around Nazi-occupied Europe with the names, uh, there it is, Wetzler Alfred, and where is he? It's Rosenberg Walter, isn't there somewhere too? I can't see him there. Rosenberg Walter, there it is. Uh, they incredibly found their way out. Now remember, an escape out of Auschwitz was not job done. Once they were out, they had to cross Nazi-occupied Poland as wanted men, as you can see from that document. They were wanted. Um, they, were, uh, uh, they had to cross marshlands and forests and mountains with no map, no compass. You weren't allowed to keep anything inside Auschwitz. No map, no compass, uh, no friends, no network of allies on the outside. They had to cross, but incredibly, they did. And they made it to their home country of Slovakia. They crossed the border. There they made contact with the remnant Jewish community of Slovakia that was still clinging on. 
and hidden in a basement in the small town of Zilina in Slovakia, they dictated a report of everything they had remembered, all the data they had memorized, every transport, every date, numbers, and they, it poured out of them. The people taking the testimony from them scarcely believed it. They kept on testing them and saying, are you sure? How can this be true? How can that be true? And it was only because their memory was so amazing, uh, Walter especially, they were able to name specific dates of transports that had left Slovakia. And the people who were taking the evidence from them said, well, that is true. There was a transport from um, Novaki on the 14th of April, 1942. That's true. You know, It did match up. And so the result was this. That's the English translation of what would become known as the Verba Wetzler Report. It was 32 pages, single spaced, and at that point, the most detailed account that had been written anywhere of what was happening in Auschwitz. You can see on the right, it says Auschwitz brackets Oswienschen, which is the Polish name. Auschwitz was not what it is now, in, uh, a name that everyone knows. They were introducing people to a place no one uh, had ever heard of then. This report would then embark on its own journey. And in the book, I've reconstructed the root of this uh, report, which is almost as extraordinary as the escape of the two men themselves. It is smuggled hand to hand across borders, secretly. Nobody could reveal in Nazi-occupied Europe that this information existed. Amazing stories of being sort of almost like a spy movie where people are passing it inside a bag. They leave a briefcase on a chair. Someone else picks up the briefcase. It gets through hand to hand to hand out of Nazi-occupied Europe and reaches crucial people. Here are the first, some of the people who would see this report. It would reach the rest desk of Winston Churchill. A summary, five-page summary reached his desk. He wrote in the margin, what can be done what can be said. He's leader of the British Empire, and it's as if he's flawed by reading the evidence of these two young men, one of them a teenager, as if, what can we do? It reaches Franklin Roosevelt in Washington, and it reaches Pope Pius XII in Rome. Different routes each time, incredible sort of circuitous good luck often is how it gets to these people. There are different ways you can go with this part of the story because we'll start with the, the disappointing side before we get to the, the other side of this. Winston Churchill, immediately on reading the report, it says to Anthony Eden, his foreign secretary, because now the report comes with a request from Jewish leaders who passed it on saying, if this is a factory of death, let's take out the conveyor belt. Let's bomb the railway tracks to Auschwitz. That's the proposal that is now attached to the Verba Wetzler report. Churchill reads it and says to Anthony Eden, get anything out of the Air Force you can, invoke me if necessary. Eden goes to Archibald Sinclair, head of the uh, U British Air Ministry, and Archibald Sinclair looks at it and says, not practical, we can't do it, because this would require bombing during the day, and we, the RAF, only bomb at night. Talk to the Americans about it. Meanwhile, the report is winding its way through the Washington bureaucracy. One person passes it to someone else. This seems more in your line of work. And then it sits on another desk for a week. Each day, the Jews of now Hungary are going in numbers, uh, thousands, to their deaths. It gets to a rate, hit the, mo the most um, prolific Auschwitz would ever be is in the summer of 1944, after Verber and Wetzlar have escaped. Uh, 12,000 a day are being gassed and it is just taking its sweet time through the desks and offices of Washington and in the end Roosevelt says no to the proposal to bomb because he says if we do that and an American bomb ends up killing some of these Jews in Auschwitz then we will be implicated in this whole horrible business so no it says it gets to the Pope having gone through a whole lot of clerics all the clerics the archbishops and others say we can't do anything until the Pope does something People plead with the Pope to say something publicly. He doesn't. But the report, let's just go back to that, the report was smuggled out by one other route, and it did reach Switzerland, where there was still a press that was not under um, 
Nazi control. It was one of the few places in continental Europe where there could be a free press. A report, thankfully, there was a British newspaper man, Walter Garrett, in Zurich, who got hold of the report, who understood the news value of it, and in one night he goes round Zurich on his bicycle, posting copies of his version of the story to the different newspapers in Switzerland. The story breaks, and suddenly it's public. The word Auschwitz is suddenly known. 383 articles appear in the Swiss press more than about the murder of Jews, more than it appeared in, any, or in all the British newspapers put together in the preceding three years. Uh, the story is out. Once it's out, Roosevelt and the Pope feel they now need to act because their publics will demand action. And they both put pressure on the uh, ruler of Hungary, where the big deportations are going on, saying, you have to halt these deportations. If you don't, and the war ends, uh, and, you, and, you know, and Germany loses, you, the leader of Hungary, Admiral Miklos Horthy, you will be culpable and you will be tried for, not, for war crimes. Then, at that point, the uh, leader of Hungary says enough of the deportations and puts a halt to the deportations. At that point, 437,000 Jews had been deported to their deaths in Auschwitz from the Hungarian provinces. This was after Rudy and Fred had got out with their warning. But that, route, that order from the leader of Hungary does at least halt the deportations before they've got to the Jews of Budapest. And so, Rudolf Erber and Fred Wetzler, their report is responsible for having saved 200,000 Jewish lives which is, to my mind, one of the most extraordinary achievements of the war. Um, it makes, in, in my view, uh, Rudolf Verber a hero on a par with, or one, a figure on a par with an Anne Frank or an Oscar Schindler or a Primo Levi, one of these people whose stories define the Holocaust. Um, I'm aware of time, and so I will say only a very little bit about this man, this is Reju Kastner, who was the de facto leader of Hungarian Jewry. Remember, Rudy's big goal in getting the report out was to warn the Jews of Hungary. He knew they were going to be next. They hadn't yet been dragged into the Nazi inferno. He wanted them to know um, about uh, what awaited them on the end of those railway lines. Kastner was the de facto leader of Hungary's Jews. And for his own reasons, and people take very different views on this question, it's all there in the book, he did not pass on Fred and Rudy's report. It was never distributed to the people uh, he, who he, Rudy, wanted to read it. They never knew what was going to happen to them. Um, for the rest of his life, Rudy could not forgive this man. And he, in fact, when Rudy wrote his autobiography around this time, you'll see him there on the left, Rudolf Verber. He wrote his, his, the title of his book was called I Cannot Forgive. Uh, because he just could not forgive those people who had not passed on his report. Of course he couldn't forgive the Nazis for having killed the Jews. They were the people he blamed most. But second for him was the people who had failed to act on the warning he had issued. People tried to persuade him and say, look, 200,000 people are alive because of you. You're a hero. But he was eaten up with the 437,000 who didn't get that warning. He was sure if they had... Maybe they'd have stampeded, panicked, tried to escape. It ate him up. The rest of his life, he became this kind of ultra-witness, this uber-witness. Um, he had a whole career as a scientist. He had, an, um, he had more escapes. That's why he was the escape artist. Behind the Iron Curtain, all kinds of adventures, which I'll tell you, but uh, which are all in the book. But he was this sort of witness, bearing witness to what he had seen. There he is at a war crimes trial in Frankfurt, Prosecutors always wanted him there because he had seen everything. He had seen the whole process. Hardly anybody had seen, done that. He'd been there so long. Uh, and, and even though he always wanted to feel and say he'd moved on, he was constantly pulled back. Whenever there was a chance to testify, literally to bear witness, uh, he would do it. The, this, the extraordinary thing to me about this story is, first of all, the story itself, but also the fact that people don't know it. And the fact that Rudolf Ferber somehow got forgotten. 
To me, as I said, I think it's one of the great achievements of the 20th century. I think it's as big a story as, as those others I mentioned. And yet he somehow got dropped out of the narrative. He and Fred Wetzler both, and we can talk about why that might be. But my aim with writing this book was in a way to enable Rudolf Werber to manage one last escape, which was to escape our forgetfulness. And with this book, I hope I've taken a step towards that. And you, by hearing his name and hearing his story, I hope you've done that too. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, well, you can stand here if you want, or do you want to sit down? Um, <laughs> you probably need to sit down after 40 minutes of, of that. I, mean, um, I definitely could sit down. But yeah. <laughs> so then. Um, I could ask a few questions, but why don't we just go straight to the audience? I think, that I, think I can sense there's a, there's a real desire to ask a lot of, of questions here, because I think that would be a way more better use of our time. So we've got this gentleman here first. Thanks, Thanks for the talk. Uh, did you meet him? I, no. Well, I have well. worked out, thank you for that question, yeah. I have worked out that I was once in the same room as him. He died in 2006, aged uh, 82, in Vancouver, Canada where he lived most of his, his post-war life was mainly there. But in 1988, there was a seminar, uh, a conference uh, in Oxford on the Holocaust, and I went, and there was a session with Claude Landsman. And I found when I was going through Rudolf Werber's papers that Landsman had said to Werber, um, I'm going to be at this conference, why don't you come? And the session that they would that he referred to was a session I'd gone to because I was obsessed with Landsman's film. And at one point, Landsman did actually say, I'm delighted to say that there's one of the people in the film is here, and Rudolf Herber did stand up. <laughs> and I was in that room. So that's the closest I got. That, but, but, but I have been able to get close to him because his first wife and his second wife were still alive when I was doing this work. And... His second wife, Robin Verber, is much younger. She lived in, uh, in the United, still lives in the United States. Amazingly helpful, long, long hours of interviews. But the story I would tell, because it was as close as I would get to meeting him, was this. Is I knew he'd lived in England for seven years, 1960 to 1967. I knew that his first wife, Goethe Verbova, had lived in England and had become a professor at University College London. I w and I asked around, and no one knew what had become of her, um, and so I did one of those emails that sometimes you do when you, it's a speculative e email when you work out first name dot last name, Goethe dot Verbova at UCL. And the truth is I wrote it in such a way, the email, um, as if probably somebody else is going to read it. I thought she's, she would be 93. There's a chance that a bereaved son or daughter is going to read this or an administrator. I sent it off. I thought, well, we probably won't. A few hours passed. Ding. Dear Jonathan, I'm so glad to hear from you. I live in Muswell Hill, North London. <laughs> it's about 20 minutes from where I live. Please come and see me on Thursday. Uh, I feel I owe a debt to Rudy to talk about him. Mm. It was the COVID summer of 2020. We sat in her garden, uh, socially distanced, and on two lawn chairs. And the amazing thing about her was that not only has she been married to him after the war, she had known him as a teenager in Turnover. When she was 12 and he was 14, she had a sort of teenage crush on him. And so she told me stories of the man before Auschwitz, uh, which gave this hugely rounded picture. On, our, on my last visit, she said to me, look, uh, my grandson is here because I have something for you. And her grandson, Jack, went upstairs and came down with this red suitcase. And the two of them handed it to me, and she said, those are Rudy's letters, and I want you to have them. And that was that moment where, I think there are other writers in the room, mm. that moment where you think, I'm meant to write this story somehow. Mm. And we had that last conversation. We had a phone call, and then the next day, Jack, the grandson, phoned me to say that his grandmother had had a fall and had died that day. And so, or, you know, 24 hours later. I somehow feel as if she wanted to pass this story on. Uh, so I never met him, and yet through all of that and the conversations I've had, I feel as if I've spent time in his company. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, you've written columns about 
how governments in this country and in the United States in particular, but also in um, uh, Turkey and India and places around the world are um, undermining institutions and pushing against the rule of law. You've written a lot about that. In your book, in your introduction, you, I don't know the exact language, but you say something like, in this story there is a, a resonance with the world we're now in. Uh, do you want to talk about that a bit? Yeah. That is why I found myself coming back to it, coming back to the story. It was one of those things where you're not even quite sure why you're thinking about something, but you're thinking about it. You, I don't think you have to get into the sort of crass parallels and now is as bad as... Mm. I don't think you have to do that, but the... Firstly, it's this realization that he had as a teenager, the centrality of lies and deception. That it is the it is the first step, and without it's the sine qua non of dictatorships and oppression is to deceive their publics. Until you cannot do the rest until you've done that. It's the it's the basic prerequisite of those sort of tyrannical regimes. That was true in the most literal way, with what Rudy witnessed on that railway platform, uh, where the victims would not go quietly unless they'd been lied to. But it is what all um, authoritarian or, or uh, dictatorial regimes do, is they start bending the truth, and so, or, or distorting the truth, and saying that truth is impossible and that we never really know. They want us to believe that, that there, we can no independent way of judging the truth except what they tell us, and become dependent on their accounts. And so, that's why people found, even if they didn't really quite know why they found, you know, Trump spokeswoman talking about alternative facts. Why was that sinister? We sort of knew it without being able to put our finger on it. And I found I was writing columns about this subject, and I wasn't really sure it was massively sort of getting through. And then COVID came along. And one of Rudy's great insights was that the difference between truth and lies is the difference between life and death. He saw that in the most immediate way. And then suddenly there's an American president saying, inject yourself with bleach. And uh, you know, people saying, don't take the vaccine and die from mm -hmm. this disease. And he thought, it, Rudy was right. The difference between truth and lies is really the difference between life and death. So it came around in all those ways. But there's this other element too, which is, I, I, I sort of galloped through the story of Roosevelt and Churchill and Kastner and the others. A big part of why they and others did not act on this report, even when it was in their hands, was a straightforward thing of disbelief, incredulity. People find it so hard to believe in their own imminent destruction. And people cannot bear to hear it, actually. And so I found that I'd already finished the book when Putin invaded Ukraine. But those stories, I'm sure some of you have heard those stories of Ukrainians phoning their relatives in Russia mm. and saying, we're under bombardment. And the relative, the, their own parents yeah. or their brothers just say, I don't believe you. If it's something terrible and unpalatable, you don't want to believe it. And I also think there's, you know, even on a different plane, but you, know, you think about the climate crisis, this warning, people are banging the table, warning us. But on some level, we can't bear to hear it. And there's the last thing I'll say, there's one moment in the book where a different uh, messenger is talking to a member of the U.S. Supreme Court and say, uh, in, the, in, the 19, in this period. And Judge Felix Frankfurter hears this evidence about what's going on in Europe and says, I don't believe you. And the man who's brought this messenger to, to the meeting in Washington says, no, no, this man has impeccable credentials. What he's telling you is true. And the judge goes, I didn't say he's not telling the truth. I said, I don't believe him. They're different. They're different because I, I am unable to believe him. The judge was being was speaking about this psychological problem. It is sometimes impossible mm. to believe the most terrible news, and the warned cannot bear to hear the warning. And that's why I think this is a you know I think it's an amazing story of the Holocaust. I think it's much more important than that. It's saying something about us as human beings. It's still true. I, I was told about the Uyghurs five years ago. Right. I didn't believe it. Right. They came to me to make a film. I didn't believe them. Wow. That's a bit like, it's a, it's, I understand his issue. It's too much to believe. It was too much. I can't, this is not believable. Five years ago, we hadn't heard of it. Yeah. 
Sorry, yeah. Anyway, next question, yeah. This is not, this is not really a question. It's, it's um, really a statement. I, I think it was last week, or it may have been the week before, there was an article in the, there's a German writer in there, uh, and she, always, she writes a column, and this article was about the digitalization of the scheme that the Germans had for compensating the victims of the Holocaust. And Germany got such um, applause and such congratulations for the way they dealt with the compensation. However, what this writer said, and in, in terms of the digitalization of this, these schemes, was it wasn't quite as generous, wasn't quite as easy, it wasn't simple in the way that the, the German government were, were putting this across. And... Um, many of the survivors had to have um, medic medical inspection, you know, med um, inspections by, the, by um, German doctors, which oh. they were totally afraid of, and yeah. it was a oh. horrific thing. But what shocked me most of all about the article was it wasn't until the mid-80s, until the mid-1980s, that that compensation, which was about 70 billion pounds, it was a lot of money. It wasn't until about the mid-80s until that compensation was finally paid to many of the victims. And many of them, had, by that time, had died anyway. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it, it kind of links into what you're saying. It was a cover-up story. It was false news, if you like, about yeah. how well they'd done, yeah. and they hadn't done that well. And that's coming out in the digitalization of this compensation scheme. Yeah, um, I mean, he, he was, I told you, he was constantly a witness. He was occasionally a plaintiff, and in one case, in the early 60s, he did seek, he joined a class action seeking compensation for that work. Do you remember I mentioned the work in the building site, mm. the construction site, for IG Farben and some of the corporate uh, 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 giants who had, you know, a a call the commercial presence at Auschwitz, and the there were, it was heard in a West German court, and they were given I think Rudy in the sixties got about six hundred pounds mm -hmm. in back pay. It wasn't compensation; they were paid back pay at work, you know, at a very very low rate. And the Ru Rudy's case was forget about us. You need to pay the families of the people who you worked to death. And the West German court held that, well, the, those people are not here pressing their case, so we'll pay mm. sur you know, surviving workers back pay uh, as if they had sort of, you know, as if this was like a, a di discrepancy with the accounts department. Uh, you know, it took a very long time, the 80s and later, for people to um, even to begin to reckon with this. And even then, I mean, Germany's record has been better than any other country in terms of reckon at least wrestling with the issues. Um, but even then, it's, it's, it's incomplete. And I think this is, again, one of the reasons why Rudolf Verber was a kind of quite an angry man, was that he felt this was a crime that had, barring, you know, the t two dozen top people at the very top of the Nuremberg trial, all the others, the tens of thousands of others, hundreds of thousands, sorry, had essentially never been punished. So it's a lady over there, yeah. No, 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 it's I'm okay. We've got a mic coming, don't worry. Get my steps I just wondered if you could say a little bit more about why you thought he'd been ignored for so long um, when he obviously had such a fascinating story. I, I'm so glad you've asked that because it's, it's, really, it's, it's really important. So I think there are two main reasons for it. The and the, fir the first one is that he was a difficult customer. He was sort of awkward. And he wasn't just awkward in his personal sort of manner, which we'll come to, but also in what the story he had to tell. Because post-war, I think the story we want is that all the evil and wrongdoing was located in the Nazis, and everyone else behaved wonderfully. And so the story of the Allies is we defeated Hitler. Churchill and Roosevelt, I would revere them as heroes for defeating Hitler. But his story was more uncomfortable than that because he was saying, mm, you had evidence of this going on and you didn't act. And 
You're not, you, of course, you didn't pull the trigger, but those 437,000 Hungarian Jews were after I'd got the word out. You don't have the excuse of not knowing mm -hmm. anymore. Um, and so he would say that, and that was not actually what people wanted to hear. In, Jew, in terms of Jewish audiences, the way he would point the finger at that man we saw, Reju Kasner, a Jewish leader in Hungary who sat on that report, again, the book debates all the reasons why he did it. You know, uh, there is a charitable reading, and I think there's a more realistic reading, which is much less charitable. But when Rudolf Erbel would be invited to speak at a sort of Holocaust you know, memorial event, the organizers couldn't rely, couldn't trust that he wouldn't go off on one and start pointing the finger mm. and accusing people. And sh to my mind, quite shockingly, I discovered, you know, he was there in Vancouver. So there, there's not a big Vancouver Jewish community. It's a small one. The Vancouver Jewish community would organize an annual Holocaust memorial event and not invite him. His own university, he was a professor of biochemistry, uh, an as associate professor of biochemistry, they would have an annual Holocaust seminar for high school students. And I spoke to the organizer, and he said it was very difficult because, you know, Dr. Verber obviously had an amazing knowledge, but he would often, it would, it would go into accusations and rage, and we didn't think these high, high school students could cope with it. And he would instead stand in the wings, watching from a sort of open door, not invited. This man who had seen Auschwitz uh, and had, got, had done everything to get the word out. When he died, there was a memorial service for him in Vancouver, and 40 people spoke. There are more people in this room now. Um, the reason why I say I'm so glad you brought it up is I think that we, society, have very unfair expectations of Holocaust survivors specifically, but of people who've gone through great trauma. I think there's this expectation mm. that they will be calm and wise and, and offer sort of healing words of wisdom. When you hear a Holocaust survivor now on the Today program, there's a sort of grammar to it. The, the presenter goes in a very soft, gentle voice, and every word is a word of wisdom. And there's no room in there for anger. And these, you know, the, he was angry. He was really angry and driven by it. And that's not what people want to hear. They want an encounter with the survivor of the Holocaust to be like an encounter with the Dalai Lama, you know, where everyone comes out feeling elevated. And he didn't offer that. He wasn't going to give them that script. He was going to be uncomfortable. He was going to say, the Nazis did this, and you, you, and you didn't do enough. And, you know, or your parents or your grandparents didn't do enough. And that, after a while, it became easier not to invite him. So he was slowly, he and Wetzler both were slowly written out of the narrative. Um, I, I learned that the Verba Wetzler report was filed in Yad Vashem, which is mm. the leading Holocaust m museum in the world, in Jerusalem, without their names on it. It was filed as two slow Wetzler But what about, well, what about now, though, in Yad Vashem? Is he... Is there anything there for him? I mean, I've been to Yad Vashem, but you have to, we'd have to really look to see something no, like that. There's there's no, I mean, one of the things I hope is that this book yeah. might change that. That's it's, amazing. They, they, you know, there was, there was one uh, Israeli academic who's fought very hard for them to get their place in, 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 and to get recognized. Um, you know, but he didn't, his, his own autobiography, which he wrote in 1963, which is a very important, you know, valuable text for me uh, in writing the book, was not published in Hebrew until 1998. You know, his accusations about Kastner and the others, mm. very uncomfortable. Um, as it happens, the Kastner, that man in Hungary who didn't pass on the word, his granddaughter is the leader now of the Israeli Labour Party. His granddaughter. She still defends him. But what, I mention it because this stuff is still... It's still relevant. It's yeah. still relevant and still painful and awkward for people, and it's easier not to talk about it. But my hope was that, you know, maybe enough time has passed yeah. now that these battles that were big in the 50s and 60s and 70s when he was being slowly sort of written out of the story, maybe enough time has passed now for people to say, okay, I don't like what he said about that, but I have to recognize the extraordinary achievement of this man. 200,000 people and their descendants, uh, their descendants are in the world now alive because of him and Fred Wetzler. It's an incredible achievement. And it's probably a very silly thing to say, but I presume in Hungary there's no kind of a recognition of what he achieved, saving those 200,000 people. No, and the, the, where there is an attempt to 
make his name more relevant. And I did. Mm. I, I travel is in Slovakia, right. and that's because as part of his of the escape, which I hope you'll all read in the story, because I've glossed over the escape, which is really the thrilling, oh, the escape's the glass, thrilling it, adventure it's, it's story. It's thrilling, yeah. And you'll never think of Soviet tobacco or whatever that's in right. the same way ever you again. Won't. That's, that's, a, that's a key clue. And the, <laughs> but but in, as part of the escape, once they got out of the cab, they were reliant on really the kindness of strangers. Yeah. And there were two or three Slovak, one a farmer, um, who played a crucial role in helping them. And so those people are now having sort of a, there's their, you know, an honored shrine because the Slovak uh, you know, authorities, but also Slovak um, you know, civil society wants to say, look, we, we did some good mm. here mm. because we actually helped Verber and Wetzler get their report out, slightly drawing a veil over the fact that they were absolutely up to their neck and kicking them out in the first place. You know, again, it's an uncomfortable narrative the Slovaks expelled their Jews before they were asked to. You know, they actually paid the, the, the Third Reich 500 Reichsmarks per Jew that the Nazis agreed to deport. And they insisted on a lifetime guarantee, meaning every Jew that's kicked out must never come back. And that was so that they could then take their houses and their homes, mm. etc. Um, the Slovaks were right in there before, no, they weren't occupied when they were doing that. Again, that doesn't really fit the narrative, which is, you know, the Germans made us do it. Not, not quite right. So, you know, I'm channeling Rudy now, where, because that would be nice, you know, the Slovaks want to yeah. honour him, good. Yeah. But actually, it's not as easy a, a narrative at all. I suppose if they want to honour him in one respect, is, 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 it, is, that, is that an honouring minus them coming to some kind of understanding of their, their role as well? Is this, is this a, you know, whitewashing of the oh, role? That's a very good question. I, I, you know, in fairness, I, I, because I don't read yeah. Slovak, I don't know enough about what they've said about that. There is now a Verba Wetzler trail in Slovakia where you can walk the route, the escape route, and I walked part of it last summer, um, retracing their steps. There are these sort of information boards along mm -hmm. the route. You know, any, any time where they're not being forgotten is to be welcomed. Um, but w w exactly the way they're positioning and framing it, mm. it's a great question, and I will ask um, someone who reads Slovak more about that. Okay. Have we got room, room for any more great questions? Should that lady over there. Well, actually, there's that guy there, just where you are, oh, by the first, okay. then we'll come, to you. we'll come to you after that, yeah. If we're not in a hurry to go, I'm happy to take all the questions. It depends on when we, when we need to close yeah, up. Yeah, we'll yeah. Be fine. I think we, I think that we can get the time for the questions, yeah. yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you for the reading. It was really nice to hear that story and kind of spread awareness. But secondly, my question, which is fairly depressing, based on, I mean, just in Jewish history, there's so many encounters with oppressors and things in China now with the Uyghur Muslims being killed in camps, very similar to those that you might find in Germany in the 1940s. Do you think there is some part of us that enjoys putting others down to raise ourselves up? the reason that it's fairly constant throughout human history to do this to people? And why do you think it usually happens to people of specific ethnic or religious groups rather than just people? Yeah. I think the, you, know, you look at history and you think, well, there, must, there has to be some kind of continuity there because what you say is right. These acts of cruelty keep recurring I mean, this, I always feel still, this is in this kind of singular character uh, category just because of the harnessing of systematized technology, state-of-the-art technology. I mean, the book goes into the detail of, of, of quite how they did it and the numbers, six million people in purpose-built killing centers. But, but the, and, and one quick thing just to mention on that, that goes, by the way, to the incredulity point. The Holocaust had never happened before. And the idea of imagining it was too difficult for people. I think, you know, it's interesting what you said about Uyghurs because mm. one of the things is now we are, we are armed with this precedent. Mm. But then, nothing like it had ever existed before. It was too difficult for people to imagine that what Rudy and Fred were saying could be true. And when that report reached Hungary, someone said, how do we know, one of the Jewish leaders said, how do we know this isn't just the fevered imagination of two, you know, reckless young men? Because the world hadn't ever seen that before. But you're right, this, this pattern of turning on an outsider group keeps happening. And I think, based on what I've read of what he said, I think Verber's view was, you're not going to change that. 
that will happen. So instead, the burden is on everyone else to stop it and to know about it. Um, this, this, he had this faith in knowledge that if people know about something, then they can do something about stopping it. So I don't think he was saying we're going to have to you know, re-engineer the human heart. It was rather we've got to be equipped to deal with it, which is, you know, information's a big, big part of it. There's so little that comes out about the Uyghurs no, now. No, no. Um, and well, you can't go there. You know, yeah, it's you impossible, can't it, yeah. impossible for reporters to go there. You know, I do, you do wonder, is there a sort of Uyghur Fred and a Uyghur Rudy in that camp thinking we've got to get, get out and warn the world? And the awful thought of, and maybe the world will just sort of shrug its shoulders even if it, you know, the, these are the sort of, the, the thoughts you end up wrestling with a bit after this story. So maybe there's a lady here at the front. It was actually, oh, okay. Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah. Only because of time-wise. Yeah. Yeah. This lady here. Yeah. There we go. Thank you. I think you must be right about your explanation of why he's uh, been ignored so much because I'm pretty sure that my father was one of the people who had sight of, not necessarily of that, that report, but certainly of a, a summary of what was going on. Wow. And he was working at Audley End House with Polish ref refugees and training them to go back as spies. And, of course, they weren't told. Um, and because they were going back as spies, they were going to the concentration camps as they were caught. Uh, and he think he felt tremendous guilt about it for the rest of his life. Um, but he thought, in the end, the end justified the means. They needed to, them to, to go and do what they did. Yeah. And, and therefore, they kept it, kept it away from them. That's fascinating. What an amazing story that is. Mm. I mean, it is quite true that information did reach Polish government in exile in London. Fragments of it, bits of it. Um, but this was the first full, full fleshed out account. But I think policymakers at the, at the sort of Churchill Eden level did know. And you know, I mentioned that scribbled remark in the margin, what can be done, what can be said. There is a historian who believes that actually isn't saying, my word, this is so terrible, what mm. can we do, what can we say? But rather than going, now this is out, what can we do and what can we say publicly, given that we've all known about it? You know, it depends how you read that scribbled mm. note, but there was information. Um, their view was, look, the best we can do for these poor benighted people is win the war and mm. defeat Hitler. And look, Hitler was defeated. And so who are we and who am I to sort of say that was the wrong call? It's just that by, you know, D-Day had already happened when they were killing Jews from Hungary at a rate of 12,000 a day. It just doesn't feel to me impossible to have done more. I'm not saying everything, but to have done more to prevent that level. In 56 days, 437,000 Jews in Hungary were killed. I mean, it was like a, a sort of holocaust within a holocaust that was, mm. I think, and, and re, I'm taken on his view of it, he thought it was avoidable. He, you know, it was, uh, by then, uh, people knew. Well, got, I think we've done, this has to be the last question, I think, right? Yeah. So this has to be the last question. You get the last question, sir. Yeah. No pressure, yeah? <laughs> I'll be, when I'm signing later on, yeah. I'm going to be signing books. Well, I'm happy to take any questions yeah. you have there. I was curious about uh, Fred's story. Is yes. he overshadowed by the f force of personality of Rudy? Another great question. Yes, he is. And, I, you know, I, I had an exchange of text messages with uh, a guy who helped me with some of the research and some of the documents just today about this subject. You know, that's a lingering feeling that we've, you know, of guilt about it. And the, the honest answer is that there was just so much less available on him um, because he remained in then Czechoslovakia. Uh, in fact, it was Czechoslovakia. He died in 1987. Um, he, the significance of that is that he then wasn't around to do the interviews in English with Claude Landsman and everything. But there's more to it than just the English language, the language barrier, though that is significant. The official position in communist Czechoslovakia about the Holocaust was this was a war on anti-fascism, not on Jews. It was, it was taboo to mention the Jewish aspect of the Holocaust. Incredible though that is to us. Um, you had to say instead this was, you know, the Nazis were a war against anti-fascists. And you really would make yourself persona non grata if you talked about the Jewish aspect of it. To the point where 
there was Rudy in London now writing his memoir, I Cannot Forgive. Fred Wetzler couldn't do that. And so the reason why Rudolf Verber became Rudolf Verber, incidentally, was when they were on the run in hiding, writing that report, they couldn't be under their same name, their real names. As you saw on that telegram, they were wanted men. So they were given false Aryan papers with new names. So Walter Rosenberg became Rudolf Verber, and he liked the name, and he stuck with it for the rest of his life. But Fred Wetzler became Josef Lanik, which was his nom de guerre kind of thing. When he wrote his account of what happened, it was a novel. He changed all the names, and it was under the name Josef Lanik. It was too risky for him, as Fred Wetzler, to admit that he had been a Jew in Auschwitz. I mean, um, unimaginable, but in communist Czechoslovakia, it was difficult. And so the result is there isn't a body of work about him. Very poignant story. He, in his end of his life, he was very, he, he was very sort of um, poor and bitter and drunk, I think, in the end of his life. And his last job that I know of was as a librarian. And I was told that there would be people in the small town library who would borrow the book by Josef Lanik and would hand it back to the librarian saying, that is the most extraordinary escape story. What a hero. And he never told them it was him. Uh, the, 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 the other piece of this is that Verber's whole life story is so extraordinary. He was, as I said, a serial escape artist. He escaped Auschwitz, but he also escaped his home country, his adopted country, and the country after that. He escaped his own name. As a subject for a book, he, he's a kind of irresistible figure, which goes to your question, actually. But it is, it, you know, if there was more about Fred Wetzler, I think, you know, I hope somebody else does a book about him. Um, but for this story, Rude, it, it was about Rudolf Wow. We could carry on, and you will carry on with the book I signing. Know. I mean, we'll give, you some more we'll give you some details about the book signing in a minute. But I just want to say, I think he deserves a round of applause for what we've had today, don't you? <laughs>